My name is Paul McLarty. I am the owner of Arise Bazaar. I have written um, two editions of a book on kimono called Kimono Vanishing Traditions. And today we're going to be doing 100 years of Japanese kimono. We're going to start with the Edo period because the Edo period, which was approximately 1620 to 1868, was the real great flowering of kimono wear in Japan. Interestingly, the word kimono means thing to wear. And it didn't specifically mean the kimono. That didn't come about until the 19th century. Actually, kimono pre-1868 were called kasode. But when they started talking to, to uh, foreigners who were starting to come in from overseas, and they would say, what is that you're wearing? They would say, kimono, which means thing to wear. And then over time, the word kimono became adapted to being specifically talking about this type of wear. What's wonderful about a kimono is, unlike Western wear, where a lot of it is about the cut of the clothing and stuff that's saying something about who you are, the cut of a kimono is very simple. It's three, it's actually four panels. It's two sleeves and the middle one with a cut down the middle. And that's all it is. It's one of the most simple robes, easiest pieces of clothing you can wear. And that's what everybody wore to one degree or another. I mean, you had some pants worn for farmers in the fields, but in general, in shops and everything else like that, you had kimono. When you don't have to worry about the cut, then what comes into play more is what is on the fabric. And that is where Japan during the Edo period really flourished. A bit of a back history. In Japan, you had about 100, 150 years worth of war leading up to the Edo period where you had a very weak emperor and you had a lot of daimyo lords trying to take over and uh, run the country. Once the Tokugawa shogun came into play, um, the country entered an unbelievable period of peace and wealth that lasted 250 years. The country was well-ordered, transportation by sea, by horse, by cart, Roads were all put into place. The country was relatively easy to get around and stuff. And when you had that much period of peace, you had prosperity growing and stuff. In Japan, you had four to five classes of people. You had shogunats and the emperor on the top. Farmers came second, because farmers are the people that provide your food. Next come artisans, because artisans would make things that you could use. And on the bottom, ironically, were the merchants. These merchants just trade it. They didn't make things or anything like that. But when you have a period of wealth growth like that, ironically, the merchants started becoming more and more economically powerful, even though as a class they were lower. You had a situation where you, in the older days, only the upper class would wear um, really nice kimono and stuff. But as wealth grew, everybody wanted to wear it and stuff. You had a situation where you had people trying to outdo each other in the kind of kimono you wear, would wear and, and what it would depict on it and all the meanings and everything has a meaning on it. Now the, the shogunate was a feudal arrangement and a feudal society is inherently conservative. So they don't want to see that much kind of thing going on where people are vying with each other wearing the more expensive kimono or the more you know, uh, flowery kimono or anything like that. So they would constantly change um, uh, the rules in terms of what you could wear and not wear, what could be on a kimono and not. They were called the uh, sumptuary laws. Now, what was interesting is they outlawed all regular people except for the upper class wearing woven kimono because up until the early 1600s it was all about wearing kimono that had been woven so ikat weaves chairman weaves things like that because of that state that decision made early on in the that time period the kimono manufacturers and the kimono makers started working on surface design that was the way around the rules on on what you could wear as opposed to having a kimono that all had been woven, you would have had a kimono that would be a very, you know, just the silk itself, and then you would have the pattern work that was done on top of it. And you had a lot of different things coming. You had hand-painted items. You had using stencil technique. You had using rice paste technique. You had the embroidery. 
you had the gradations of silt then like on this. But really, ironically, from a law that was trying to maintain the difference in classes, it led to this explosion of figuring out new techniques, new ways of, of working with kimono and stuff. This is our first kimono. This is an Edo period kimono. This is Chiraman silk which is the highest grade silk in Japan. They would have 114 grades of silk in Japan. It's characterized by the nubbiness of the silk. One of the things that's really fascinating about this one is, if you notice, if you look closely, you'll see some gradations on the color blue one here, coming down here with these colors here. And how they do this is they use something called a chaya zome technique. Basically, they cover the entire fabric with a rice paste. They know all the thing in the front and the back, and then they would dip it, and only a little bit of the dye would come through, and then they do it again and stuff. So it would build up these colors. And you're talking about literally hundreds of hours worth of work just to do this backdrop. What's interesting about it, they've lost the process of having to do that because they, the way they did it, they had to do a certain kind of rice paste. And that formula got lost, so no one knows how to do this process to this day right now. One of the things is everything has a meaning in Japan. So right here you have a scene. If you look closely, you can see mountains in the backdrop. You can see a waterfall. You see cranes. You see a number of different kinds of flowers. You'll see that also you have different techniques go into play. You have the use and stencil technique on the flowers, excuse me, uh, using rice, dye rice paste on that. You also will notice the embroidery on top of, of different items. Now these dyes here are all traditional Japanese vegetable and mineral dyes. If you notice how bright the colors here are, these are probably dyes that came in from the Dutch merchants. And that's where you're using aniline dyes. So you get more brighter colors than you would get. So obviously the upper class immediately wanted these things. And ironically, they were probably so expensive, that's the only people they could afford it. Even though in Europe, they weren't necessarily that expensive. You also have a lot of gold calcium work on this part right here and this part right here. This is literally where they'll take gold foil and fold it over the thread, then lay it all down. And then if you can see up close, you'll see little red threads thousands of them holding down that, that, that gold foil line right there. What do we have on here? What's interesting is it's a beautiful scene, right? Someone's at a, a waterfall with a lake there having a picnic. It could be as simple as that, but, but it's not. There is actually a lot going on. Everything in here has a meaning. There are pine trees. Pine trees are Long, uh, steadfastness, good fortune, rebirth, um, long life. A lot of times on weddings, you'll see, when they have the, the wedding cloths, you'll see pine trees representing a long marriage and a long life. You have mountains. In Shinto religion, which is the indigenous religion in, in Japan, which is nature-based, mountains are considered sacred. You have peonies right there. So the peonies are a symbol of good fortune and bravery and honor. You have kiku, which are the symbol of the monarchy and purity and trust. You have the sakura blossoms, but we have plum blossoms on here. Acceptance of transience and imperfection, elegance and faithfulness. The cranes are good fortune and, and long life. And the waterfall is purification and sacredness. We are now on to our second kimono. This is still the Edo period, very late Edo period. I can tell by some of the dyes that you're looking at, like around 1864, 1865, very close to the end of the Edo period, which ended in 1868 with the Meiji Restoration. So this is another kimono, definitely worn by an upper-class woman. Chiraman silk again, like we've talked about before. Some of the same motifs that we've seen with the cranes and the pine trees, very potent symbols at all time. This one has some, some interesting work on it too. One is it has the three friends of the winter. We have the pine, the bamboo, and the plum. So the reason why these are called three friends of the winter or three are uh, bravery 
is because these are the three plants that are either green in the winter, or in the case of plum blossoms, they sometimes blossom when there's still snow on the ground. They were grouped together. It came from the Chinese originally. They were grouped together as the three friends of winter. You'd see this uh, symbol in kimonos, and you would look at them and you have no idea that they actually had a meaning, but they did. If you notice down here below, you'll see a turtle, and you'll see it with a long kind of trail of, of a tail. And what that is, is that is seaweed. In Japanese mythology, the turtle is like an immortal creature. So that represents the long, long life of the turtle and the seaweed that slowly accrued to the turtle over time. No, it's, it's very similar since you have the, the, you have the three symbols of, of winter or three symbols of bravery. So they wanted to put that out there that they like winter or they, you know, they feel brave as individual. I mean, like again, everything, you know, you have the cranes, which are good fortune. Everything on here, the waterfall is a symbol of sacredness too. Everything, literally everything on a kimono will have a meaning. Every plant, every animal, every tree. You don't usually see people on kimono, but you'll see everything else. If you notice over here in the corner, you'll see the scroll down there. One of the things is that for the Japanese, the gifts that came in from, Japan, uh, from China, uh, the, or the trading goods that came in from China, were unbelievable. I mean, Jap uh, Chinese society compared to Japanese society, particularly earlier on, was just so much more advanced. I mean, the Japanese are from Chinese descent. They're the ones that came across first to Korea, and then across the Sea of Japan to Japan and became the Japanese. The original people of Japan were the Ainu, the Ainu are more related to what we would consider like the, uh, the Eskimos, the Mongolians. Everything, particularly with the upper class, the upper class always look towards China for wisdom, for art, for painting and stuff. So you'll see symbols on upper class kimono that are very much influenced by China. One of the items sometimes you'll see on kimono, sometimes you'll see a ship. And on the ship, you'll see a scroll, and you'll see a battle axe, and uh, you'll see different things like that. And what they represent were the magic gifts coming from China. And, uh, those, and the stuff that was coming from China was all for the upper class. This is probably worn by the, the matriarch of the family. If you notice in these little areas right here, you have a design that looks like shibori. And shibori is the Japanese tie-dye, where they would use little pebbles and tie them off, and they would get that little effect like that. But these are actually not that. They are meant to look like that, but it's using a stencil technique. So these areas here are hand stenciled, putting down the, uh, the rice paste. This area here, they used a, a stencil that looks like this. That out. This is a larger version and stuff. That's using a very small amount to do a stencil. On something like this, it's a very large amount. And what I, what's wonderful about this, this is a way of saving time, which kind of cracks me up. And I'll explain why I say that. Each color would have to have a different screen. And you would have, you would lay down the screen on the silk, and you would pack it with clay around the parts to make sure it was held down carefully. And then you would seep your one color dye that would go down for these areas open here. It would sit overnight, you remove the clay, and then you do another screen for the other colors that are going in. Sometimes up to 16 or 17 screens. I, mean, I remember when I was learning about this from my sensei in Japan, I said, how is this a time saver? It seems to me that it's way more time. And what he explained to me is it was a time saver for the master artist. In the old days, the master artist would have to paint every single piece. Right now, you could paint it once, hand it to his assistants. They would make the mulberry leaf paper. They would do the cutting for each of the colors. They would lay it down. They did all the work. But for him, <laughs> it was, OK, I did it once, and that's all I have to do it. And they could reuse those screens, particularly in small areas like I'm showing you, like here. It's very easy to be able to use that in places all over the kimono. One of the things I love about this is it's made from mulberry leaves. 
If you know anything about jet silk, it is without mulberry leaves, you don't have silk kimono. Because it's the only thing that the silkworm eats, is mulberry leaves. But there's something about the paper that makes it very stiff and it doesn't bleed. So when they lay down the dyes, dyes don't seep through it. So you get a very clean, fine line on it. If you remember earlier, we talked about the sumptuary laws and stuff. And they would go on constantly, year after year, they would come up with new rules to try to stop the evasion of the early rules that were happening and stuff. And this is one of the pieces that are a prime example. As I mentioned earlier, the merchants were on the bottom of the class. By the late 1600s, they were really starting to amass a lot of wealth. And like all people, they wanted to show it and stuff. But they had to be careful. This is a man's monsuke. It's got five family crests on it in the back. All places. Oh, am I wrong? It's got five in the back. Five crested monsuke. Suke means five. And mon is the family crest on it. So he could wear this out in public. Simple silk, you know, very high quality black silk, a very simple design. But once he ended up at a friend's place or in the floating world district, you know, he was buying drinks for his friends, he wanted to impress the geisha. He would casually slip it off, turn it inside out, and then we show the brocaded pattern on the inside. All this work, show a little bit more, that he wasn't allowed to put on the outside, he put it on the inside. One of the things I find fascinating is about when rules and regulations are placed on industries, on peoples, on cultures, the ingenious way they figure out their way around it to get what they want. So this is a great prime example of doing that. We talked about how he hid this beautiful lining on it, and, and some of it was this is an expression of his wealth, a, a brocaded kimono like this, one of a kind kimono in those days. But the other thing he was trying to say when he wore it inside out at the Geisha House, he was trying to say that he was an educated man who liked the art. Everything on here has a meaning. You have the mountains in the background, which are sacred and hark back to China. That's based on the way these mountains look. You have a haiku up here, which is probably about the scene with it. You have a scroll down here, which tells you that he was an educated man who could read and write. Um, he has a tea container on it with highly stylized writing. All in all, the whole effect is to say to the person who gets to see it inside the geisha house is, I'm a man of wealth and a... like a red, the red lining inside of the sleeve, not necessarily in this one, um, got, because the red color was considered kind of flirtatious also. Um, different parts of the body became more prized to look at. When the whole body's covered, you can only see a little bit of the neck or the nape of the neck. That became an eroticized zone. One of the things that I like about this piece is, it, this is the first one we've shown you that has a number of fans on it. And in this particular case, the fans are being used as a framing device. If you notice on a couple of the fans, they're highlighting the cranes. So it's a way for them not to get lost. I mean, it's such a busy design overall. There's also some gold couch and thread work on the other frame, well, the fan down here with the, uh, the crane to make it stand out. You have bamboo on it.
This piece is overall is a mix of both using uh, hand dyed and using stencil technique on it, as we discussed earlier. Another motif repeated from some of the earlier kimonos we've seen is the, the bamboo, the plum blossoms, and the pine needles. So there's three symbols of bravery and stuff. So you'll see these, like I said, you'll see certain motifs popping up all over the time, and sometimes they're subtle. Sometimes they're not necessarily grouped together, but they're on the kimono as a whole. One of the things I wanted to show you was the inside lining. If you notice, the pattern is continued. Even though this is not seen by people when she's walking around, there's still that attention to detail, something I really like and respect about the Japanese culture. This kimono, in particular, young woman again, the long sleeves, this is probably very late Meiji, early Taisho. And what's interesting about that time period is, is that Japan had had their Meiji Restoration in 1868. You had gone, gone from the shogun running the country to more of a democracy, a, a parliament, uh, European style government. You had a lot of, for the first time ever, you had a lot of young women moving to the cities, living independently, you know, or in group homes or whatever, but something you did not see that much in the Edo period and stuff. You had, what was interesting, both, they both wore Western wear, but you also had a lot of people who was never, were never able to wear kimono when they were younger wanting to wear kimono. And you had a little bit more boldness coming in with kimono designs. Taisho era is known as one of the really interesting time periods because it definitely um, brought in the influences coming in from Europe and the United States. Ironically, among collectors 20 years ago, People were more interested in the Edo and the Meiji period, but recently, the last five, six years, people started realizing the Taisho period is fascinating because of this melding between things that were learned from the West, perspective, design work, and artwork, um, was mixed with the traditional Japanese. Believe it or not, this piece was probably worn by an upper-class woman. And the reason why I say that is because you have the peacock and the phoenix, which are both strong Chinese birds, not indigenous to Japan, although you would have some peacocks coming in from uh, China. On here, the, you have the bamboo, the iris, and the lotus bulb opening. The lotus is a symbol of Kuan Yin, which was Buddhism. Again, the upper class were more Buddhist. The working class were more traditional Japanese nature-based religious Shinto. The symbol also, the lotus, is goodwill, kindness, and love. The iris is a symbol of purifying yourself, protection from evil. But this piece is so dramatic that I, I have a strong feeling this piece was possibly used for performance art, for no play, for a dancer, for theatrical, because the colors are so bright and so big, even though all the designs are very traditionally upper class. It makes me think this was used for that type of activity. You'll notice it's a mix of hand-painted work in places like this. You see more of the gold couching work. You notice how bright the gold couching is on that. So some of that is the change in the, of techniques that allowed the, the gold not to be as tarnished as you might have seen in some of the earlier pieces we showed you. And what's interesting about this piece is even though it's a later period, and like I said, I think it was a theatrical piece. They still followed with the techniques of having the art done in the inside, which is rarely have ever seen. And a fair amount of, you know, all this gold paint work you see, all done by hand. This was a theatrical piece. This cost a fair amount of money. On the one hand, this piece is still carrying this love towards Chinese motifs. And on the other hand, this piece is clearly more modern, more bold and interesting. So you have the two realities coming together. It's a really dynamic time in Japanese culture in that early 1900s. And one of the things that people don't realize, I talked earlier about how prosperous the country was. 
By the 1920s, Japan's economy was the seventh largest in the world. You have a country that had never been attacked or successfully attacked, had never been occupied at all. So, and then you had 250 years of peace during the Edo period. So there was a tremendous amount of wealth and a lot of it went towards kimono. We are looking at a, a uchikake, which is a wedding kimono. One of the ways you can tell that is by the thickness on the bottom. The other way is with the two phoenixes. This is really fascinating. It's the first time I've seen a kimono with both a female and a male phoenix. The phoenix in China was a symbol of the imperial household, particularly the empress. And this mythical, mythical bird represents fire, the sun, justice. So a very big symbol in China and therefore a very big symbol with the upper class in Japan. This, like I said earlier, is the first time I've ever seen it, both the male and the female on it. Usually you'll see a wedding kimono that will have a phoenix and then maybe you'd have the, a dragon representing the male energy. So you have the male, uh, dragon was a male too in Chinese culture. This is a use and stencil technique, both by hand and by stencils. If you notice, you have some great gold couching work. You have some of the uh, silk thread embroidery on it. You have beautiful moans on the top, family crest. Polonia is the flower on it. And I love the gold clouds on it too. One of the things I find interesting about this piece is a lot of times the phoenix is a symbol of a new beginning. And it fits with the fact that this is probably right at the start of the Taisho period. So this is when the Meiji Emperor had died and the Meiji Emperor had ushered in a new society after the ending of the Edo period. When you went to a, like a monarch, democracy, a parliamentarian setup. I think this piece was both about the marriage of two people and this very unusual showing of both the male and female phoenix as opposed to a, a female phoenix and a dragon. And I think it was also marking that occasion of change. The other thing that's really nice about this is you have the Finally, we have the polonia leaves, which is a symbol of a baby girl. It's one of the wishes, obviously, from this woman of having a, a, a daughter. And this one, unlike the other one, which had all these upper class statuses, that's why I thought it was a theatrical piece. This one is a beautiful piece. This one is, is delicate. And you really have to know what everything means to understand what's going on. Like I said, I have never seen a kimono with both the male and female phoenix. Right here, we're late Taisho period, probably around like 1918, 1920. Again, I brought you the best kimono, Chiraman silk, one of the highest grade silks. One of the reasons why I like this piece is how large the pattern on it. There's really not a lot of other patterns on it. There is the cranes, there is a lot of pine trees, that's about it. Really different. So again, you're, you're seeing outside influences coming into play. Uh, like eight, 1918, 1920, 1925 time period. A little bit different techniques being done. You see how the pine needles are, are being done on this one. It's using some uh, uh, metallic, gold and silver metallic work on them in these parts. But the Taisho period, as I mentioned earlier, the really fascinating period it was the first time that, um, that a lot, I mean, it was happening during the Edo and the Meiji period, especially artists. Uh, people like Hokusai and Hiroshige, they were looking at European paintings with perspective and stuff. So there were subtle influences coming into Japan from the West. But by the Taisho period, it was really an interesting melding of, of, of several different traditions. And this piece is such, on one hand, it has the fidelity to Japanese symbols, 
with the cranes and the pine trees. But on another hand, the, the boldness of this pattern and the fact that there's only these two items on it. It's just a fascinating piece. Again, with a long sleeve, an unmarried woman. You can imagine these sleeves swishing around. But I just love how, how large of a pattern, how big the birds are on this piece. There is also some subtle work with some gold calcium work down below on this bird down here. That right there is a lot of handwork. That's probably about 5,000 stitches, red stitches on that gold thread work, holding it down. The, the gold thread is too thick to be actually be going in the fabric. It's just laid on top of the surface and then you do these little red stitches over it. So imagine how much time that took. So each one of those rows would have to have that stitch and you have to be able to get it up and around the next row and then the next row and the next row. Very interesting piece. Like I said, around 1915 to 1925 period. Both realistic mix of traditional Japanese with the Chirman silk and the cranes and the pine trees and also really a reflection of the times. So we had an interesting question from the audience, which is, how could a Japanese woman, who at that point was probably five foot, one foot ten, five foot one, wear a kimono so long? And how she did it was bunching it up a lot. Jasmine here is going to show you a small example of that with the kimono she's wearing. You notice a little fold right there? On a piece like this, you'll be folding even more than that. And one of the things I find fascinating about that is you would lose about this much on the fabric. And yet they still did the pattern on it. So this kimono was both designed to be worn and you'd be missing some of that. But this kind of kimono sometimes will also be put in on a kimono stand at the home, in the bedroom and stuff just for their own personal pleasure. And yet they still did the pattern on it. This kimono was both designed to be worn and you'd be missing some of that. But this kind of kimono sometimes will be also be put in on a kimono uh, stand at the home, in the bedroom, just for their own personal pleasure in the sense of aesthetics. As I mentioned earlier, a tremendous amount of wealth was tied up in kimono. And they were considered a form, you could get loans based on your collection of kimono. You could, you know, they were a source of wealth in the family, particularly for the woman. Our next two pieces are really different pieces from the rest of the collection, but they're so special that I wanted to share them with you. These two pieces come from the Hodge collection. These were a couple in the 1950s and 60s that she was Japanese and he was from Holland, uh, American uh, businessman. And they started collecting minge, uh, which is um, it's the art of things that were made for a purpose, but in hindsight is now looked at as a piece of art. And they mounted an exhibit that went across the country from New York to San Francisco and they wrote a book about it. It was probably one of the first mentions of Minge in the United States and in Europe. And it was really celebrated by the Japanese. And when they went to visit Japan, they were invited to the, uh, the palace. They met with a lot of upper class Japanese and they were donated a number of gifts for them. I think they were probably gonna to try to do another book these next two pieces I'm going to show you are extremely high society, uh, high class pieces. This is a court piece. And this is a court piece that was worn by a male. No, very, very bright and whatever. This particular weave is called Kaori weave on it. It's just the, the way that the, the, the diagonals go, with the embroidery on it. This time period in this piece is probably 1920s. It's based on a piece that was worn earlier at their period of time. Makes you think of what it must have looked like at court. 
to see a piece like this. One of the things I, I, I'm pretty sure on these, these look like the handles for swords. Right here and here and here. Which would make sense, but obviously designed more for a court look with the brightness of the colors. This kind of weave, this is probably a machine woven in the 1920s and still a very valuable piece, but in the old days this would all be sewn by hand. A pretty plain looking piece, but this is actually a very valuable piece for a couple of reasons. One is it's wool and there were no sheep in Japan. The only wool that came into Japan up through the 1868 was from the Dutch, and it was very expensive. I mean, the Dutch would pay ridiculous prices for the stuff they got from the Japanese, and the Japanese would pay ridiculous prices for what they got from the, the, the Dutch. So you, uh, the upper class, upper class samurai loved it. Uh, wool was great, it was more protection going into battle, even though they weren't really in battle at that time, there was still that sense of like, riding your horse out there, having a material that was thicker. If you notice, the, uh, the collar on this is stunning. That is all hand done work on that, the gold thread. That's probably about 40 or 50 hours worth of work just on that collar. And look at the inside, the great wave. Now I'm gonna show you why this piece, even though this is a later period piece, why this piece is so valuable. We talked about the fact that the Edo period was dominated by the Tokugawa for 250 years, the Tokugawa clan. This is a moan from one of the subclans from the Tokugawa clan. This would be a piece that was worn by that, that group of, of the family of the Tokugawa clan. That's why getting this piece was so exciting for me. You don't see many of these pieces out there. The Tokugawa clan was, when Japan, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Japan had a system of the emperor running the country for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But in the 1500s, again, a period of prosperity, you had a lot of lords wanting to jockey for position, wanting to take over the lands of the, the lord next door to them, the daimyo. Daimyo was the name of the, the lords at that time period. And you also, the emperor had become weaker and weaker. They'd become isolated in Kyoto. And you had a lot of very ambitious, wealthy men who wanted to take over the country. And you had about 100, 150 years worth of wars. And the Tokugawa clan was the one that was ultimately the victor. There was a couple other people beforehand, but they're the ones that ushered in this 250 year peace. And they owned a lot because of that. Tolls from the, the water boats coming in. Uh, 25% of all the rice fields in the entire country. And they ran the country relatively well. Ironically, the early 1800s was considered uh, a real high point of the Edo uh, period. And yet within 50 years, it had crumpled. Outside influences really affected. They tried to really control it. I mean, there was so few people from outside, chi some Chinese traders coming in, they kicked the, the Portuguese out in the 1650s because the Portuguese had um, brought religion there and there was a, a Japanese Christian um, uh, rebellion in the 1650s. The, the uh, shogun put it down and then kicked all the Portuguese out immediately. And the only people were, that were allowed in were a couple ships a year from the Dutch. Sometimes those ships weren't even allowed, I mean, the people in the, in the ships were not even allowed to cross into Japan proper. A lot of times they were put on an island that was right there near, uh, I forget what uh, city. But there was, you know, the country was tightly controlled. And once Admiral Perry came in Japan in 1850 and people saw the, the power the steamboats had as opposed to what the Japanese had, it was the beginning of the end. That's a relatively long time of period, a 250 year period. I brought this piece because it's, it's another interesting piece that has some history to it. And one of the things I love is when I can get a piece like the, the Tokugawa piece that has a historical aspect to it. So this is from the Baron Korosu family. This is a late 1930s piece. And what makes it interesting
University. And they had two daughters, so they were Japanese American. And they had grown up most of their life around the world. But they had never worn kimono. When they went back to Japan in the late 30s, the one daughter was getting married to another upper class family, Baron. They were called Barons at that point, uh, Madame Your Lord. And the mother in law took her out to buy kimono. And when I say buy kimono, they were commissioned for her. And one of the things I like about it is, since she had no experience wearing kimono, there was little slight things done differently for her to make it easier. So you notice there's a seam across the middle on this piece. She probably did this afterwards, but when it's done originally, you know, you're supposed to bring it up, bunch it up. She probably wasn't comfortable doing it. It's a lot of work and probably cut it like that. One of the things I love about this, it's a cloud pattern. And it's really Chinese influence, again, the upper class and stuff. It's the nicest silk, Chiraman silk. But the story of the family is what's fascinating to me. The man she married became a pilot. He, it was a very difficult time with the war and ended up going crazy and they got divorced. He retired from the government because he wasn't happy with the government in Japan at the time, how militarist that they had become. And when the war, they retired to the countryside and the wife became actually a local hero because she brought in her knowledge of American agriculture and applied some of it to the area. And when the war ended, they invited American officers to come and stay with them. Both the daughters ended up marrying American officers and moving to the United States. Each of these pieces were made specially for her. We got about eight. The granddaughter I met, and she had read my book, and she called me up and she brought me these pieces. And I, I, the story, I love when history comes into play. And some of the, you know, what's wonderful is each one of these pieces were handmade and hand designed. They were very expensive pieces. I just like the fact that these were just like in the older days, were one of a kind kimono. By this point, Japan, you know, one of the things that's fascinating about Japanese textiles is that they changed with the times. And we'll talk about this with the next piece that's coming up in more detail. And it's interesting that one of the first things that happened when, when the Meiji Restoration period started and the country opened up to the rest of the world, literally one of the first things that was sold to Japan were looms. So the kimono manufacturers realized very early on that it was going to be a very different world, that they weren't going to be catering just to the, the riches of the rich, that there was going to be a lot of middle class people that are going to want to buy kimono, and they were going to have to figure out techniques to bring the price of kimono down. And this next piece we're going to show you is going to talk a bit a bit about that. This particular one is a single or one of a kind piece because it was for an upper class family. But it is interesting how quickly that the kimono industry was able to pivot, both continue to serve their upper class clientele, but also uh, make changes in kimono that made it affordable for a middle class clientele. As I mentioned, the, you know, the 20th century brought a lot of challenges to the kimono industry. If you, you didn't have the majority of the population wearing kimono anymore. You um, didn't have as many kimono being purchased by the upper class. I mean, you still had some, but not like it was in the 1800s. They understood really early on that it was important for them to pivot, to reach out to the fact that Japan was now having more of a middle class. It had more single women moving to the cities. And what was fascinating is Japanese loved kimono. Even people who didn't necessarily wear much of the night worn cotton kimono really wanted an opportunity to continue with that. The manufacturers had to figure out ways of having less labor intensive methods. All the stuff in the 1800s was being done by hand. So like a, this is called shibori right here that I'm looking at. Have you noticed if you, uh, on this piece you have a mix of the one color, the, the light red color with the white. And in the old days, this would have been done by a technique called shibori, which is they would use small pebbles, maybe rice as a grain, and they would fit it into each one of these little areas. See the part that's got the little dot there and then it's white around it? And they would tie it off. That would be the white part that was tied off. 
And the only thing that would show up was the part where the pebble was in the inside. Now, if you look at this, and it's front and back, you will realize that there were several thousand of these in this piece, several thousand. And in the old days, this was done by hand with these little pebbles or rice or grains. This was incredibly time consuming. I mentioned earlier that the ecot weave, which is a tie-dye in the thread, which is something like this right here, where you literally tie off individual threads and then weave it afterwards. In the old days, this was done by hand, and it would take someone two months to do maybe two yards worth of fabric. You realize how expensive it was. This is the tie-dye on the thread on this particular one. This is the tie-dye on the material. You're looking at, and they're very, they were very good at what they were doing and very fast, but they had to do the pattern or something like that. You're looking at hundreds of hours worth of work. This piece, though, was done in the 1930s or 40s or 50s. Post-World uh, post War II, 1950s, maybe even 1960s. And what I love is it's still hand shaboried but it's done in a different way. So in the old days, they would use those little pebbles. You have the material, you'd be laying them down, you'd be tying it off. It's a lot of work, it's kind of awkward. This was done on a dimple board, they call it. You would have a, like a board like this, and you would have uh, spikes coming up with the rounded balls on the top. And you could lay the fabric on top, tighten it down on the sides, and then the person could be there, very skilled, they could tie off 20 times faster than the old way of doing shibori. So this is one of the ways that the, the kimono community figured out to still bring in this handwork on a piece but make it affordable. Now in this particular piece, which we're going to turn around, this is also another change going on. This is called a michiyuki. This is something that wasn't invented to the early 20th century. So even with all these changes going on, you still had innovation going on. This was meant to be an outerwear kimono. So you'd have a kimono underneath of this, and then you would wear this on top of it to protect it. And that's why it's got a very different kind of collar than the normal one. It would still show off the kimono you're wearing underneath, but a lot of the rest of the upper part of the kimono was protected. They obviously didn't have snaps like that back in the Edo period. This is showing on the inside too. And look at that. Again, you don't even see this pattern, but they did it on the inside too. And that attention to detail and that love of that in Japan is just incredible. Thank you for bringing that out. As I talked about earlier, you know, there was a lot of wealth in kimono and stuff. And the, and the, the wife, of a family that owned hundreds of kimono, both for her husband, for herself, for the children or whatever. About 30 or 40% of her work in the home was managing the kimono. You have five seasons in Japan for kimono. You would wear a kimono only for that season. If you wore it out of season, it was a major faux pas. So you had winter, you had uh, spring, you had summer, you had summer into fall, and you had fall. Think about your husband, yourself, your children, some of your major servants, would you ride them with kimono and everything like that? You're talking literally hundreds of kimono. And they didn't have dry cleaners in the 1800s. Once a year, maybe once every two years, depending on how much often certain pieces were worn, they would have to unthread all of these kimono bring them to the river, wash them, dry them, and then have them re-threaded again. And like I said, there was kimonos for every purpose too. There was kimonos that were everyday wear. There were kimonos for funerals. There were kimonos for weddings. There were kimonos for certain kinds of events. You had to have the whole workup. In those days, <clears throat> the kimono were the, all the full length kimonos. As I mentioned, as the 20th century came about, there was a real interest of wearing kimono from the middle class. And you had some real innovations coming in. One of the innovations, as opposed to having full-length kimonos, two levels of full-length kimonos, you started having a shorter one, both in terms of cost and also in terms of convenience. Wearing a full kimono 
traditionally can be a little bit cumber cumbersome. Although it's interesting that, you know, the women are so graceful, but it is a lot of work. This is called a haori. This is something that was invented around the turn of the century. It was more convenient for a more of a middle-class person. But you still see a lot of attention to detail on this piece. Nice silk on this. You have an inside lining that still has a shibori tie-dye on it. This was probably done on the dimple board we talked about with the last piece. If you notice on that one, there's some basting threads. This is how you would take care of the piece in between seasons. And as I mentioned before, you had to wear the right kimono for the right season. So you would have kimono for all five seasons. We were talking about how do you handle the different seasons. And in the wintertime, you would see the use of wool in kimono. They would blend it in with the kimono. In the spring and the fall, sometimes you would put in cotton with the silk. So the, the, the fabric on the kimono wasn't always pure silk, depending on the season and where you lived. In the summertime, which gets very hot, you would see a lot of use of, of rami, which is a grass. Um, what's nice about the grass is it's scratchy. And when something is scratchy, unlike pure silk, which will stick to your skin, the scratchiness will allow it to stay off your skin and let the air pass through it. You're supposed to wear a kimono for all five seasons. Even the middle class people would try to do that and stuff. They may not have had as many but they would have one for each of the seasons. And the pattern to reflect that, you would see uh, fall leaves on uh, kimono in the autumn and stuff. You would see more uh, the three symbols of winter, three symbols of bravery in the, in the winter time. You would see lots of, of, of green plants and a spring kimono. And this is gonna be our last kimono. I picked this one because I love the fact that it has so many buildings on it. And you did see this in kimono in the Edo period too. This is another unmarried woman's. You see the long sleeve on it. But what I like is it really depicts the times. And one of the things that happened, particularly from the 1930s on, is kimono started reflecting the times. So if you notice, if you look closely on this, you'll see you have electric lights. So you know this was not a, you know, a lot of kimono would refer back to the Edo period, the golden ages. But this was worn by someone more fashion forward. They were, you know, they're doing a traditional kimono. It's a lot of handwork on this piece. It's a lot of use in stencil technique on it. There's, there's the gold calchin, there's some embroidery. But I love the fact that they show a bridge with a, a lantern that clearly dates it to minimal 1920s. This particular one I know is made probably the late 1930s. Purple is also interesting. Purple was a color that was really reserved for the upper class in the, uh, particularly the emperor's family, the, uh, the samurai, excuse me, the shogun's family in the old days. So now by the 20th century, you no longer have any of those kind of rules and stuff. And that brings up an interesting point I wanted to make that one of the things I loved, I talked about how people in the industry would dodge and evade the sumptuary laws. So one of the things that they would, every year they would come up with new laws about length and motifs and everything but one of the things they would come up is they would sh they would have um, outlawed certain colors that were reserved for the royal family or the shogun or whatever and what I loved is the kimono dyers within a week or two would come up with a variation that was just a little bit different because of course whatever the emperor had or the shogun had of course other people wanted to have it but they didn't want to get arrested so this was the way around it just like we had the kimono earlier where you had the beautiful pattern on the inside. So that'll be our last kimono for today. We're gonna to show you some of the sashes that are used to, to keep the kimono together now. We've talked a lot about kimono, but these are the sashes that hold the kimono together. And ironically, in Japan, a lot of times, especially in the old days, the, the obi, these are called obi, the obi would actually cost more than the kimono in some cases. Because you have a piece that is, that is, if you look at it, this is on both sides, brocaded, you're talking about 12 to 14 feet long of brocaded fabric. So a lot of times the obi could cost more money than the kimono. And in Japan, the obi was actually considered 
the centerpiece overall and stuff. So what we've brought to you is a number of different OBs to give you a sense of how things changed over time. One of the things I talked about earlier is how the kimono manufacturers had to adapt to a different clientele with a different budget to work with. So you see these two over here, these two would be the most expensive. These would be even being used, these were probably machine woven, but these would still be three or $4,000 each in the 20th century. You go back earlier, be equivalent of much more than that. So then you go to a piece of all this brocade and work on it. Then you go to a piece like this, which is really lovely. They're playing off, they're not exactly, but they're playing off a turtle shell uh, pattern, a hexagon, which is a big symbol. The turtle is a big deal in Japan. They, they look at the world as being balanced on the back of the turtle and stuff. Something like this, you have a lot more plain silk, and this would be about half the cost of something like this. So you start seeing more OBs like this coming in. And then we have one down here that we call the Nagoya one. This gives you the brocade, but what it's done is it's cut a lot of the fabric. When you put it on, you still get that top part showing here, but instead of having 12 feet of it, you then have a much smaller part that cuts down your price a lot. So these are all different methods that were used by the kimono manufacturers to allow the, the item to be affordable to their customer. This is an example of what a man's obi would look like. Most times it would be a little bit less wide than this and stuff, with this kind of pattern on it and everything. They would also wear a soft sash called a heko obi. The men had it a lot easier than the women did. They had less layers to wear, the kimono was more flowing, they could move around, you know, especially in the old days, you know, you had to fight your samurai battles. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of, of, of something that was extremely expensive originally, um, literally sometimes more than the kimono. With, a, with that, with that both sided too. So you're talking about 12 feet long, both sides all brocaded, and in the old days all hand brocaded. And then how the industry adapted over time to be able to still give you the authentic kimono experience in Japan, but to fit the budgets of people at the time. So I want to thank you, my vast audience here today. This is a very nice time, and I enjoyed it. Thank you. And this is Jasmine Taylor, by the way, my assistant. We tried to give you a, an overall experience of kimono wear in Japan going from the Edo period up into the present day, the various techniques that were used, the meanings behind the kimono and the importance of kimono in Japanese culture. So thank you very much.